Welcome to Casual Friday. So in this week's Technique Tuesday video, I talked a bit about how to count rows in your knitting. And I was talking about how the row count can be, the way you count can be different depending on whether you're counting from a cast on edge, counting somewhere in the middle, or you're anticipating how many rows um, to knit before you bind off. So I went through those different scenarios and then I talked about how the cast on edge that you want to appear on the right side of the fabric can be controlled based on manipulating the number of, of rows that you work after you cast on or by manipulating or modifying the cast on edge itself. And I said I would talk a bit, of more, a bit more about that today. So that's what I want to do. So in case you didn't see that video, one of the things I talked about was how some cast on methods produce one row fewer than other cast on methods. There's this knitting uh, truism that um, pops up that the long tail cast on produces one row more or produces an extra row of knitting and then people want to know, well, should I count my cast on as row one? I have never thought of the long tail cast on as producing an extra row of knitting but I have thought of other cast on methods as producing one row fewer. And the reason I think that is that because when you work the long tail cast on, however many rows you actually work after you cast on is how many rows of, of knitted fabric you actually end up with. Where other types of cast on methods like knitting on or the backwards loop, otherwise known as E-wrap cast on, for those cast on methods, when you work your first row across all of those stitches, what you're doing is is removing those the cast on loops off of the needle. Uh, it takes another row of, of knitting before you actually get a row in your fabric. What surprised me, I always learn something when I make these videos because I'm often showing multiple examples or multiple ways you might use this and I'm thinking about using it in ways that maybe I don't or haven't used it before um, or maybe I've just have never done a side-by-side -side comparison. I almost always learn something from these videos when I make them and what I learned this time was that just because a cast on method ha uses a single strand of yarn doesn't mean that it's going to be a cast on where you have to work two rows before you get your first row of, of fabric. And because I had I had done four different swatches, I'd done one with a knitting on, one with a cable cast on, one with a basic e-wrap cast on, and then one with a long tail cast on. And I knit 10 rows across and then I bound off on the 11th row. So the long tail cast on had 11 rows of fabric as I would have expected, knitting on, and the backwards loop had 10 rows as I expected. The cable cast on had 11 as well and that surprised me to the point where when I was working this watch and I was, I'm like okay I've, I'm, I'm not counting my rows right from the time I cast on what what's going on. So I cast on again and I as I worked across the very first row I saw that it did indeed create an actual row of fabric unlike knitting on which is almost identical I mean, they're variations of each other. So I found that really interesting. So I, I loved learning that. So, but that just confirmed to me that you can't say that the long tail cast on produces an extra row of knitting. But what you can say is that some cast on methods um, produce one row fewer. So what do you do then if your pattern tells you to work a very specific number of rows at the beginning before you do whatever the next step is, like maybe you're transitioning to a different stitch pattern or something like that. Are you, should you work an extra row or not? Or, or what do you do? Well, the issue isn't, isn't just how many rows of knitting does the cast on produce, but it also has to do with what does the edge look like on each side. Some cast on methods like the E-Rep look identical on both sides of the fabric. So it doesn't matter uh, how you work on which, uh, which face of that cast on is the right side or wrong side. Um, it will turn out perfectly, it will turn out exactly right. It will look right no matter what. Knitting on and the cable cast on do look slightly different on each side, but they don't look that different. Like 
you have to be you have to look pretty carefully to really tell the difference between uh, the front and the back um, on that cable cast on and knitting on. But the long tail cast on, when you do the standard method, which is creating a twisted loop and immediately knitting it, so you're knitting those twisted loops every time, creates pearl bumps on the back side of the cast on. So the, the, two side, the two faces of the long tail cast on are very different from each other. Now, some knitters either haven't noticed it or, or um, they've noticed it and they just accept whatever they get. Uh, that's which is what I used to do. And I noticed that when I, I joined in the round with the long tail cast on, I had that smooth side facing out, which I much preferred. But if I was knitting back and forth, almost invariably, I would have pearl bumps at the bases of all of the columns of knit stitches in ribbing. And I didn't like that, but I didn't know how, what, what to do about it. So that's what I want to talk about right now is uh, some of the different tricks that you can use in order to make sure that you're going to get the edge of the cast on you want to face the right side. Because as I mentioned with the long tail cast on, if you're working in the round, you automatically get the smooth side. But if you're working back and forth, if the very first row you work after your cast on is considered a right side row, you're going to get Bumps. This is true for any cast on method. You know, whatever you see when you're knitting flat, you're going to see the other side when you're knitting when you join in the round. And unless you work uh, a flat row first and then join in the round, which is a work around, it's not the way it would normally um, work out for you. So in most cases, a pattern is not going to tell you to work at a very specific number of rows in a particular stitch pattern they're going to tell you to work to a certain length. So what you need to look at here is is the stitch pattern you're working is it the same on both sides of the fabric? Are you working every row exactly the same or are you doing something different for one one face of the fabric versus the other? So for example, if you are working knit one purl one ribbing and which is a two stitch repeat and you have an even number of stitches, that means you're going to start every row with a knit one and you're going to end every row with a purl row. So even if your pattern tells you very specifically, you must knit 16 you know, rows um, and then work the next, and then transition to the next thing. You can decide after 15 or 16 rows if the side that's going to be the right side has the edge that you want facing and if it doesn't then you can work one more row and then you can go on to the next step so you can fudge one row that way or another way if though you are working in say knit one pro and ribbing which is an even it's a two stitch repeat but you have an odd number of stitches that means the rows are going to be symmetrical but not the same so every row that one row is going to start and end with a knit one and then on the opposite row you're going to start and end with a purl one. You're still knitting your knits and purling your purls but how you start and end that row is going to be different. So that's a two row repeat. You're alternating between one row and another. So what you do is you look and you see well is the row that's that's going to be the right side row which is probably the one that starts and ends with a knit one um, my first row after the cast on, do I want this, this uh, cast on edge to have the knit one uh, at each end or do I want it to be the purl one? So you can start with a row two instead of a row one. So you can alternate which one you start with. You'll still end with whichever one is supposed to be your right side or wrong side depending on what the pattern says. So you will be working one extra row or one row fewer but you'll get the edge that you want. So you, so this is the same thing as with garter stitch. If they say that you, they want you to knit every row, um, you're working every row the same, but it still is a two row repeat because with respect to one face of the fabric, you have a purl row on top of a knit row on top of a purl row. And that's another uh, situation in which you can evaluate, do I want to work one more row before in, um, before I switch to the next stitch pattern or not. If you are making these kinds of alterations or modifications, um, keep a note on it. If you are one of the lucky people who can manage to keep track of a notebook that you keep in your project bag and you write down everything and you can always find that notebook, do that. If you're like me, 
uh, who I love to write things down on pieces of paper and then throw them out or lose them. I, uh, I have a Ravelry project page that I start before I even cast on. I, I create it and then I keep those kinds of notes and in my project um, note, notes. Now, sometimes you can't fudge the cast on that way. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to start with row two and then I'll do my repeat. The sweater that I've been working on for my daughter has a two row setup. Um, and then it starts in on the right side row. And that setup requires that the first row after I cast on has to be a right side row, which means that that would force me to have that row of pearl bumps going all the way across at the base. And I didn't want that. So this is a situation in which I would use a modification of the long tail cast on. And there are tons of modifications to the long tail cast on. It's worth um, being aware of a couple of them and even trying them out so that you can see when you might want to use them in certain situations. So for example, let's say I'm making a hat and I want a super wide headband, you know, that I can flip back. Uh, I might want a cast on edge that looks the same on both sides rather than having either side at all have pearl bumps at the base of those knit stitches. So in that case, I would find a way to make, create a reversible edge. And there are a couple of ways to do that with the long tail cast on. One is called the alternating cast on, where you um, work knit stitches as you normally would with a long tail cast on with a thumb loop creating the twisted loop and then using uh, the working yarn to, to knit the stitch. And then if it's supposed to be a purl stitch, you create the twisted loop with your index finger yarn and you use the thumb yarn as the working yarn. So you're alternating back and forth between that and that will pr produce a reversible edge that's in pattern. Uh, this is not my preferred method for creating a reversible edge because I just have a terrible time telling this, telling which are the knits and which are the pearls in this particular suit. There are a couple of reasons that I don't like it that have no logic to them. It's not, it's just a personal preference. My preference if I'm going to do a cast on a pattern is to actually cast on as knits and pearls using the same twisted thumb, thumb loop. And for the pearls, I use a Norwegian pearl. Um, but if I use the English method of long tail cast on, so instead of having the working yarn over my in, my left index finger, I have it in my right hand, then I can just move the yarn to the front when I want to do a purl stitch, like I would if I was knitting regularly, and move it to the back when I want to do a knit stitch. And then that thumb loop creates every uh, one of the twisted loops. But you can use this idea, the same concept that's used in the alternating uh, cast on where you're, where you're using a twisted loop off of your index finger and then knitting off of the, of, of the thumb yarn instead. And you can use that in order to cast on in purl. And that's what I did for the sweater um, that I'm making for my daughter. I cast on all of the stitches in purl and then I, uh, the next row, when I turned the cast on, the smooth side was facing me, and then I was able to, do, to work my right side row. And I chose to do this rather than to cast on in pattern because on this particular uh, sweater, all the wrong side rows are purled all the way across. So it made sense for me to create a cast on edge that, was, that had purl bumps all the way across the back. So the next thing I want to tell you about is my little adventure this week. I took a little field trip um, this week down to Decorah, Iowa. And I had a very specific reason for going there. So there's a museum down there. And I'd heard about this museum years ago when I went to a, a Knitter's Guild meeting. They had a monthly program. And there were two women who were talking about a book that they, they had written a book of, of Norwegian-inspired um, sweater patterns and they were talking about the process of writing this book and the kind of research that they had done and one of the things that they mentioned that they did was every couple of months they would drive down to Decora to look at the sweaters in the, in the museum down there and they may have named the museum at the time but it didn't stick with me uh, I did remember Decora and then they said oh they have these big drawers of uh, sweaters. You just open these doors and they have these sweaters in there and we would look at them and we'd study them and take notes and all this. 
And I thought, well, that's a fascinating. I was thinking it was a sweater museum somehow. I didn't really understand what this museum was. But over the years, I heard different knitters talking about, oh, have you ever been down to Decora to see the sweaters down there? And uh, so I just, that stuck in my head that there's this museum down in Decora, Iowa, that has Norwegian sweaters. So earlier this year, when I was taking my Latvian mitten class and I was discovering that different knitting traditions will have different uh, ways of handling uh, the strand of color work, depending on what it is about their particular tradition that's unique and that creates specific problems that you may not have in other stranded color work knitting traditions. And that's when I realized that, well, I realized a couple of things. I, first of all, I looked at some of my really old um, stranded sweaters that I had knit in the first couple of years I was a knitter. So I was had been working um, different kinds of color work at that time. I would work in Tarsha, and I, then I would work uh, stranded. And my memory, and I'm not sure if it's the influence of the intarsia that informed how I work my strand of color work or if the patterns may have said something about twisting the yarns when you change. Because with intarsia, you're working, it's color blocks, so you're working all in one color for many, many stitches, and then it's time to work the next color. So you have to link those colors together. And then you work and you drop the old color and you just continue working with this new color until it's time to drop that one. And then you link those two colors together and you have to link them because unlike other, you know, all of the colors, all of the stitches that are the same color are linked together with a running thread. But when you switch from one color to another, there is no running thread. So if you didn't link those threads together, they, there would be a hole. And if you, and if these two colors meet in a vertical line like this, pretty soon you just have two selvage stitches going right up the middle of your sweater. So you have to link, it's important to link them. So when I did stranded color work, either the, and I have some memory of some patterns telling me to twist the colors together, and it may have just been something I thought I had to do. So that I would switch, when, when I switch from one color to another in strand of color work, I would, I would do that, um, you know, bringing one color under the other, uh, under the other every time. And of course, at the end of a round, then you have the yarns twisted around each other, and so you have to untwist them at some point. Well, over time, I learned how to knit with one color in each hand, and that um, facilitated keeping the strands parallel to each other because when you bring one under every time you get what are called rotated floats and you see like they look like they're at an angle at the back of the work as you switch from one to the other. But when you hold a yarn in each hand, you get parallel floats. Now you can get parallel floats if you hold both in the right hand or both in the left hand, but when you have one yarn in each hand, it really, really forces the parallel floats. So, so gradually over time, I used that method and then with the Master Hand Knitting Program, they're focused on fair isle knitting and they're focused on those types of motifs and that style of knitting. And these, this is the style of knitting that comes from a, a tradition that, English speaking tradition, and so the English speaking of the English language knitting books and most of the teachers or whatever sort of teach this, but it has become sort of the default method of teaching stranded color work, where it's really important to do that for fair island knitting, and it's really important to understand which color is going to be dominant in, in terms of which is going to show up more um, in that style of knitting. So, of course, when I was investigating all this, people were saying, well, have you seen Arnie and Carlos's videos? And, 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 and I hadn't seen those specific ones, and I did a whole follow-up about that. Um, they are focused on Norwegian knitting, but one of the things that they say about Norwegian knitting is that the goal is to have really even tension, like have all the stitches be the same size. One of the things about fair isle knitting with the parallel floats is that you have the two yarns floating along in parallel, and the one on the bottom, when it is knit, is going to create large, a little bit more elongated stitches. And this is especially obvious if you only have one stitch in like, so if you have like a, a main color background and then you have the pattern, little contrast, little blip here, little blip here, little blip here, you'll really see that difference in stitch size. That little blip will be 
obviously larger. And you'll also see it if you are alternating every other stitch, like one will definitely be bigger and, and more in the foreground than the other. So that's something um, that, you, that you learn about working a strand of color work with parallel floats and understanding what the dominant color is. And, and again, dominant by meaning the foreground, the one that creates the contrast color pattern. So I was really interested in seeing these Norwegian sweaters at this sweater museum. I didn't really know what this museum was in decor, so I, I googled it and I found out, oh, it's called the Vesterheim Museum of Norwegian American History. It's a national museum of Norwegian American immigrant immigrants. And in, here in the upper Midwest where I live, there's a huge influx of Norwegian immigrants in the mid to late 19th century and then early 20th century. Lots of people who live here in the upper Midwest are of Norwegian descent. I am not, um, but I do have one Swedish great-great-grandfather who immigrated here during that time period, and he, and he lived here in Minnesota, which I never knew until I moved back here and started doing genealogy. So it turned out, so it turns out it's a, it's a museum of Norwegian American history, and they have a lot of artifacts. They have a lot of, like, um, carved things. They have things that, that were made in Norway that, that immigrants brought with them and, um, and then were later donated to this museum. And this museum started in like 1877, so it's been around for a long time. Now I also have experience uh, going to museums, hoping to see something that I know they have in their collections, and then being disappointed that it's not on display. Uh, I had that problem when I went to the Victoria and Albert, Albert Museum about 10 years ago. I had seen on their website that they had these 350-year-old, you know, knitted baby garments or something. And I really want, it would be the oldest knitted thing I would have ever seen. And I really wanted to see it. So I went, I went there one morning, I got there, and they weren't on display. And then I learned, oh, no, we don't have everything. <laughs> Oh, I was pretty confident that these Norwegian sweaters were not going to be on display because I saw that they had done an exhibit of the sweaters a couple of years back. So I emailed the museum and I said, I'm really interested in looking at these sweaters, uh, wondering if it's possible. I would like to photograph them uh, on the outside, but I'm really interested in looking at the inside. Would I be able to turn them inside out and photograph the inside because I'm researching the techniques that they would have used. And I got an email back and said, yep, you sure can. Um, just, you know, give me, you know, a couple of dates that you think might work for you to come down. And so I arranged to come down this past Monday. So I went up and indeed they do have drawers. I didn't get to see the drawers. So the curator, she's the head curator of artifacts at the museum. She would bring out the contents of one of the drawers at a time. There's usually five, maybe six sweaters in each in each batch. And then she would leave me to uh, to look at the sweaters and she had taken notes on all the different artifacts and she said she said what do you want to know about them like what information do you want to know about these particular artifacts so i said well i'd love to know when it was knit if that's known if the if it's known who the knitter was and where they lived in norway i would love to know that um and then the rest of the information I would get by turning it inside out and looking and taking the photo photos of them. So she would go off for about 20 minutes time and she'd come back and check on me to see, you know, if I was going to be ready for the next batch or not. And uh, eventually she came back with a spreadsheet that had all this information. And she knew a lot of the information just off the top of her head and like where this one came from or a little story about uh, this one or that one. Um, which is really interesting. So I had this spreadsheet. I took all my photos. Um, and she would point out certain things that I hadn't even noticed. Like I was so focused on like the strand. Like a lot of times I was so focused on the color pattern, especially on the reverse side, that I didn't even notice certain things about the front. There was one uh, sweater I was looking at and she said yeah we think that she lengthened this one and she pointed to uh, a particular area on the sweater so the sweater had like this main diamond pattern and it had this uh, three color strand of color work all the way from kind of framing it and the curator pointed out to me like there was like this whole ribbing and like 
and the background color was like it's either she used different dye lots or there's something it almost looked like either it had been taken apart and remade somehow there was something it was really interesting it was obviously handmade so a lot of the sweaters were commercial sweaters they were sold uh, in stores in uh, Norway and then brought over here or they were sent over here but they were all hand knit so they were all home knitters and one of them was from a company that at one time employed as many as 800 home knitters. So for those sweaters, they didn't know who the knitter was or where in Norway it was knit. But they did know it was hand knit. And she didn't show me sweaters that she said, we're not sure if these are machine knit or not, some of them. Although she brought one out toward the end. And I just, it was one of these things where I looked at it and went, oh, that's machine knit. And then I thought, how do I know that? <laughs> And it was because it was very fine gauge, but it had a tubular cast on, which you can do in hand knitting. Um, but then it was it was really like even knit one pro one ribbing. Like there was another sweater I looked at that at first I thought this is such even tension. I wonder if it was machine knit, but um, I could tell from the rib, the ribbing, the knit one pro one ribbing. I I could tell it was like no, that's hand knit. So. Uh, so it was really interesting, and most of the cast-ons were like the old Norwegian or twisted German cast-on, which is another confirmation. I looked at things like the increases on the sleeves, and they, a lot of them used knit front back. Not all of them, but most of them used knit front back. Um, and then there were some sweaters uh, that were knit as early as like 1910 or in the 1910s. Uh, those were the, the earliest sweaters and the most recent one was like from 1980, 1985, something like that. Um, all knit in Norway and then sent over here. So for those sweaters they tended to know who or they thought they knew who it knitted. Like it's probably knit by his grandmother or it was like this is either knit by this little boy's mother or the maid, one of the two. And those were really interesting because obviously they didn't have any sort of quality control that they had to undergo. And the skill of the knitter could really vary. And I would say amongst those where the knitter was known um, had the entire range of sort of the least skilled or the most like, well, we're going to make do with this type of sweater all the way up to the most beautiful sweater. It's like there's one sweater. It was knit in 1946. And it was knit by this, the donor, it was knit by his grandmother who lived in Norway. Every year, they would the kids would lie on the kitchen floor and their mother would trace their bodies and they'd send the tracings to their mother, to the grandmother in Norway, in Bergen, Norway, and she would knit them each a sweater. This sweater, first of all, it had a lot of heft to it. It just felt more like substantial and heavy than some of the others. And uh, it was just so beautifully made, and it had these suede armpits, and it looked perfect. Like, I didn't know until later that this was knit in 1946. Some of the older sweaters that maybe had some stains on them, or there was some wear, or one of them was kind of felted. So, uh, you know, there was, uh, it was obvious that they were older and had been through a few, <laughs> a few things. This one, it was like, you know, if it were sitting on a counter in an expensive department store, you'd pay so much money for it. It's just beautiful. And hand it by this guy's grandmother. Well, I got home and I looked at my photos. I was looking at these photos in the back. I was really zooming in because I was looking as closely as I could when I was looking at these sweaters, but sometimes really hard to see, especially if they use a really dark color and then with the contrast. Sometimes really hard to see exactly what they were doing on the back side. So when I zoomed in on this photo, the cream color yarn, I was like, that looks like hand spun. So I couldn't tell with the gray. It's it's too hard to tell whether she used a hand spun yarn for the gray, but it looks like the cream yarn was hand spun. It's a two ply hand spun. It looks nothing like the yarns used in any of the other sweaters. All of the other sweaters looked like they were very consistent three ply yarns. Even the sweater knit in 1910, all three yarns looked exactly the same except for the color. It was just, that was a really interesting thing. So, so what I expected when I went down there and I was going to look at the backsides of these sweaters, 
is I expected to see a variety of techniques. I thought that there might be um, might be more consistency in how certain things were handled. Uh, I expected maybe to see more rotating floats than uh, parallel floats, for example, in order to get that consistency in stitch size that is supposedly important in Norwegian knitting. So I was really, really surprised to see, especially in the areas that you see so much on Norwegian sweaters where it's like a big background with just little flecks. Um, let me just show you something. Hold on. So this kind of situation where it's mostly a background and then you just have these little flecks and they kind of alternate. So that I was thinking, well, those are probably be these rotated floats because they don't, they're not enlarged. And I would look and it was, it was parallel floats. I'm like, how are they doing that? And I started looking and looking and looking. And the thing about the thing that, that was very difficult about this is I know what stranded color work looks on the back side, but I haven't spent that much time poking around, like trying to read somebody else's stranded color work from the from the rear. <laughs> so I started questioning, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? Which is that for parallel floats, like I said with Fair Isle knitting, that bottom strand in Fair Isle is going to be the contrast color. It's going to be the one that creates the little flex. And it is going to be larger. Those stitches, because they start down here, they're a little, they're longer than the ones that are created from the strand that runs along the top. And in these Norwegian sweaters, first of all, I could see whenever they do that kind of color work, it's so obvious that it was parallel floats. You, there's no, there's no angling ever. It was just straight across. So they were obviously parallel. And for the ones where I could see, they were, they were doing the opposite. They were, they were using the dominant color in terms of the one that has most dominance in terms of number of stitches. So the background is the one that they're running across the bottom and they were doing the little contrast flips along the top. And so I started comparing one after another after another, and that's, that's what I was seeing. But again, I got to the point where I, I saw so few obviously rotated flows, like nobody was doing it regularly except some knitters who were using three colors at a time were rotating their flow. Like you could, you could just see it. It's just, it, you, it doesn't take any poking to see that that's what was going on. So that really surprised me. It's, and it's very difficult in, in stranded color work where there's three colors to really see what's going with what. So that, that was difficult and that was frustrating and I couldn't quite confirm that. But I could confirm that um, they did use parallel floats often, uh, much more often than I expected, and that and then that reversal of the technique was something that was unexpected to me. So this little swatch that I knit here was um, was a experiment to see what it would look like if I did that. So I did that. I'll, I'll put it on the overhead. But the bottom row is knit in this in this using that technique where the the top float in the parallel floats was used to create the pink. In the center I used rotating floats and along the top I did the, the use, use the bottom strand of the parallel float to create the pink flips which are obviously larger than the stitches around them. Let me show you the back side. So you can see uh, on the top and the bottom that it's parallel floats. You can see that um, because there's no angling as there is in the middle, where you can see that there's kind of that diagonal uh, line at the transitions, they're showing that those are rotating. But, but at the top, if it goes straight across constantly, then you know that it's parallel. But what is difficult to, to determine is whether the two, the blips that are above and below the pink, those two white blips, which one is a float and which is a stitch. It's it's fairly easy to see that in this particular swatch, but it's very difficult to see in 
um, those sweaters that were so dark and especially difficult to see in a photograph of them. So I did get, I got, it got to the point where um, I realized what I needed, what I actually needed to have with me in order to look and poke at these sweaters because part of the, 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 this little swatch here, because there's spacing between each row in which there's color, it's very easy to, to figure out what um, strands are going with which stitches and which row, but there is some distance between the actual stitches and then the, the floats. They're quite a bit far apart. When you have row after row after row with lots of strands all in there trying to sort out what is going on where, it can be a little frustrating. So if I ever go down there again, I know what I'll bring with me in terms of reference so that I can be sure that what I'm seeing is actually what I'm seeing. Um, but what I got out of this was that there is no uh, Norwegian knitting police that were saying everybody has to knit this way, that there was variation amongst knitters, and uh, which is kind of what I expected. And what I didn't expect was how many parallel floats I saw, and I did not expect the reversal of um, background, foreground um, colors. And I think it's a really fantastic way to deal with, um, with, with the color work in their tradition. So that was what I learned. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you some photos and do some voiceover of the photos of some of the sweaters that I saw. This is the oldest sweater in the Vesterheins collection. It was knit. They're estimating um, between 1905 and 1910 based on who is knit for. It was knit for a little boy and based on the size they were estimating he was probably about eight years old when he wore it. So it was knit sometime in that time period either by his mother Camilla Heiberg Stoylin or by their maid whose name was Anna Scram and it was knit in Christensen Norway. So it's three colors every row and that means you have three strands for every row to try to decipher on the back side of the work. So it's uh, more or less parallel, but it's really hard to tell when she, if she may have rotated some of the floats some of the time. She certainly wasn't rotating whatever new color was. She wasn't bringing it around all of the other colors every time. There would have been a distinct uh, diagonal nature to all of the strands every time if she had done that. I think that she may have done a lot of parallel floating, but I'm uh, not 100% sure. What was interesting about this is that she doesn't, it didn't appear to have been trapping floats, at least not all of the time, because there's some matching red thread that you can see near the tops of the diamonds uh, where she tacked down or somebody tacked it down. Maybe they did it later. The curator was speculating maybe that was something that was done later. Maybe things were getting caught and so they were tacking down some of the floats um, at a later date. So the next couple sweaters I have are from Fana Norway. So this is a distinct um, style of sweater that's very specific to a particular region of Norway. Um, and the style is called Fana, which is where the, the, the area in Norway it's from. So they have that checkerboard um, pattern on the bottom. And then there's sort of that um, the stripes across the center part where you get the little flecks of contrast in each of the stripes. And then at the top you see the, the star pattern. Uh, what's interesting about these sweaters is that they don't have ribbing around the neck or the front of the cardigan or the wristbands. Instead they have this woven ribbon. And this particular sweater, the curator said that this is a hand woven ribbon and um, it's really, really beautiful to see. It's really hard to, to read the back side of the, the star patterns up near the shoulders because the, they have that, uh, this fabric facing that they sew on the inside of the sweaters to help stabilize it since there's no ribbing or anything. And then here's another one that looks so much like it, I had to go back and check to see is this the same sweater or not, but it's not the same sweater. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, than the first one. 
um, but same colors, same general um, style. These Fauna sweaters were both knit in uh, the early 1950s. So this is probably the next oldest sweater. This one was for a woman. It was apparently a ski sweater and it was knit in around 1918. So that was really interesting. And that center portion, the cream portion with the, the flex of contrast, those are parallel floats. Uh, harder to tell in the uh, areas below where they have multiple colors. Poked and prodded a bit, but couldn't tell for sure. So this sweater, it just says the, it has the surname Hyman, and it is, was knit in Kongsberg, Norway. So this last one is, uh, is one that had me stumped for a little while. It was knit in the 80s, so it's probably the most, the newest sweater that they have in their collection. But I opened it up and I looked inside, and again, you have the parallel floats on the inside. Um, but you can see there's kind of a zag, a zigzag in the in the parallel float. It, it, it's going along, and then it, zigs, it zags up to the right a little bit and continues on. And I saw that, I was very puzzled by it. There wasn't a symbol, this is sort of at the side seam on the right edge of the body. Uh, there isn't a similar one on the other side. I thought, is this some kind of short row technique? What was going on? You can't really tell from the back side or from the right side of the work. If you look at the back of the sweater, you can't tell. And, you know, because you have these, these lines of blips that are the offset from each other. So it's really, I just couldn't tell what was going on. I finally realized she had made a mistake. She had knit, you know, two thirds of the way across and maybe put her knitting down, picked it back up and just kept knitting in one color. Uh, so she'd forgotten to do the blips. And so then this was a corrective, a way to, to correct it and then not break the yarn at the same time. It's it clever, but it was a stumper. I really thought it was something she had done uh, deliberately. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.